The word of God is the same today. It was the same yesterday and it will be the same tomorrow. It says we are created to be like God. In true righteousness and holiness. God. But are we going to be like someone we do not know? We are not supposed to try and butter up the word of God. You know, he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Now, he grew up in the palace. He was a young man between the age of 17 and 18 when he began to fight for his own people. He stood up to defend the Jewish people when there, were, uh, there was a controversy and they were fighting against each other. He already knew his purpose from a young age. You must know your purpose as young stars. We saw Samuel. Samuel was born by um, Anna, if you remember that. And from little age, as from the age of say something, three years, he was already in the temple, serving God. So you are not too young to serve God. And he became very prominent. We saw David. David was a man by 16 to 17 of his uh, age, he fought Goliath to a standstill. He defeated Goliath. And before even meeting the Goliath, he was the man who goes after the father's business. He was very handy, always in the bush. The other brothers were lazy. Well, they were a national army, but they, they really were people who were too. If, you, if they were ladies, you say they were they were cheeky. But this guy was committed. He was the only one following the father's ship. And he was the last one. And God chose him. He became great. You know about the story of David. We know Jonathan was the firstborn of the king Saul. He was a man of integrity. These are young stars. All of them are very young. The, between the ages of 17 and 18, and some of you are already 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. I think the, the, the biggest amongst you will be maybe a little bit about 30, they are about, we don't talk about age with ladies, isn't it? But I promise you, these are young stars. The youngest or second youngest are king in Israel. His name is Josiah. He became a king at the age of eight. And the Bible said, had this record about him. It said he pleased God. Eight years of age. The scripture recorded he pleased God. I pray you will please God. Amen. So that you don't look at yourselves only for yourselves. You will look at yourselves in the light of God. And that's what I want you to remember. Because your lives will be punctuated with God's goodness when you begin to live your life to please God. We have a man by the name, uh, okay, a lady by the name Esther. And that Esther, I named this one after that Esther. The father wanted Cleopatra. And I told him to keep quiet. Cleopatra is somebody I don't know. Esther is in the Bible, I know Esther. So I give her name after that. That lady. She was an orphan. No father, no mother. Hallelujah. Amen. But she grew up to become like a savior like Jesus Christ. She saved her people. She was a young girl. Naturally, she should be a loose girl. But she stood up. She listened to the uncle. The uncle raised her. She became very responsible until she became 
the queen in a strange land. Nothing can stop your greatness. Amen. You just have to make a decision to be that outstanding because God is looking at you. We have another one, Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a young boy when the call of God came upon his life. He received the call of God at a very much younger age, possibly younger than yourselves. Because at the time, Jeremiah chapter 1, he said, I am too young, you cannot call me. And God said, don't call yourself a young man. I have placed my call upon you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I knew you and I have called you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. So God told them, don't worry about your age. I'm going to send you. I have called you. I will use you. Young as you are, I can tell you very clearly that the call of God is upon every one of you in this ministry. You're different. You just compare yourself to the people out, out there. You will see remarkable difference. You are all too different. That's why you cannot mix up with the Joneses. You are unique. And God has placed a call upon every one of you. Hallelujah. Amen. We see a man by the name Daniel. Daniel was a young man. But he took a stand for God. I cannot defile myself with the portion of the king's men. Meaning, what is going on in the community, I will not defile myself with it. He stood out. And there were three Hebrew boys that were with them also, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were young people, but they stood out. They took a position for God. We're not going to be like them. You know, these days, it is more of, I want to be. In speech, in action, in behavior, in attitude, it's like we are copying the world and the people who are considered loose and lost. They are now our model. No, we are God's dear children. And it is cool to be a child of God. Are you hearing? It's beautiful to stand up. In his days, things were messy. But they stood out for God. And they became great. Now their names are written in gold in the scriptures. Now we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, in her days, Things were also as dirty as they are now. But the woman was a virgin. Young lady, but she kept her virginity. Until God, looking for somebody to choose, God found her. It is my prayer that God will find you. Amen. It's no longer cool now for somebody to say I'm a virgin. You are green. You, you know what I'm saying. Your friends will boo you. Your friends will talk against you. They will tell you you are so foolish, you don't even know things, you are losing, you are not enjoying life. But it is still God's will that we maintain those kind of lifestyle. And that does not condemn anybody who already is no longer a virgin. It does not condemn you. It does not condemn you at all. Just understand that from this time, you can actually be set aside for God. That's what I'm saying. And then Jesus Christ. He was a young man. He even died 33 and a half years. He wasn't a young man. And indeed, all that he did affected the entire world till today. As a young man. So if he did it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. There was a little boy that brought the lunch. For Jesus to perform the miracle of feeding the 5,000. How many of you remember that little boy? He was a small boy. In his time, at least he made an impact with his lunch. And then you see, the last one that I have as an example here. There were four daughters born to a man by the name Philip. Four daughters. A man gave birth to four daughters. And four of them kept their virginity and they became prophetess in Israel. I wish when I get to heaven, I was going to look for that man specifically to find out how did you do it? You looked after four girls, and all of them were decent, disciplined, they loved God, 
and they began, they, they, they kept, you raised them to the point, the mother's name, the wife's name was not even mentioned. But they kept four gods and they all worked for God. It is my prayer that all of you will work for God. Amen. Regardless of the pressure. Amen. Now, as I bring you to a close so that we can answer questions. Who am I? Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29. Proverbs 20, 29. That the glory of young men is in their strength. I like to take that first part. The glory of young men. Okay, add ladies, young men, young ladies, is in your strength. For the lady, your strength could be your beauty, your strength could be your intelligence, your strength could be your 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 grandeur, your 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 your, your posture. Whatever it is that is your strength. The Bible says the glory of your men is in their strength. Today you are strong. Amen. But you will not always be strong. Why? Because look at that brother in Manna. That, that one in the middle, taller than me. A time there was, he was not this strong. But now he's a very strong man. Possibly stronger than me, as you see. I was once like him. I was once in his age. And I was a very strong person. But now I'm not as strong as he is. So life is in faces. Now, wisdom holds that you use your strength very well. Because you will not always have the strength. Are you following me? If you misuse your strength, a time is going to come when you will have a lot of regrets. Because your energy was wrongly placed. Even though it was your time. Now you are in the time of your strength. First Corinthians, uh, First John chapter two verse fourteen says, "I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him, that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men. And when I say young men, including young women, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. So strength is what we are identified with." Every one of you, you are almost at your prime now. So mentally, this is your height. You are in the very best form of shape. My focus would be, if you don't use your brain power now for the right things, you may lose them forever. Now you have energy to study four or five hours. And I know there are people seated here now that we are going to pray for today. They spend nothing less than five, six hours on the phone doing games, doing other things on the phone. You don't like it, you know they are not productive, and we are going to pray for you today so that God will set you free. Because that is addiction. But your power, your brain power, is been exhausted in those things. So when you wake up in the morning, you are supposed to be strong, but you are more tired than you went to sleep. So in the class, you can't concentrate. Because your energy is been wrongly used. Young lady, young man, you need to understand that your strength must not be put in the wrong direction. Otherwise, you will lose your identity. Hallelujah. Amen. You have strength, but it must be well guided. Well guided. You are beautiful, yes, it must be well channeled. Otherwise, you will accept mediocrity for the future. So this is very vital. 
And lastly, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. Jeremiah 23, and chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in their wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in their might. Let not the rich man glory in their riches. But let him that glory it, glory in this. Before I continue, what does it mean to glory? It means don't take pride in your strength. Don't brag about your smartness. Do not brag, brag. don't brag. There's nothing to brag about. Yeah, I'm a strong man. Yeah. Don't brag about it. And it goes further to say, but let him that brags, let me use that word, brag in the fact that they understand and that they know me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth. Is it for in these things I delight? So if there's anything you are going to be very proud of, is the fact that you know God. This is what they cancel from the world. What you can brag about is your knowledge of God, your relationship with God. Joseph bragged about his God, and God delivered him. No matter where, they put him in prison, they put him everywhere. In fact, Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. But because he bragged about his God, he was delivered. They were all delivered. And they became great as their destiny spells. You will become great. Amen. Because God wanted you great. Now, the only thing you have to hold on to and brag about is your knowledge of God. So my question is, do you really know God? Do you have a relationship with him? I need you to answer that to yourself. And I stop. Anointed for a sacred place. God very chosen. Blessed be divinity. The spirit's fire ignites in your heart. Your God through dark and light. Standing as one with faith ablaze. Running your race. For you are called to be a bee in the night. To stand and spread his love, his truth, and his light. Your dreams are his vision. And that is where his vision shines. A chosen generation with divine desires. With a broken heart, the youth can heal. With shattered pieces that can be brought back into one piece. Youth of faith. Rise up and believe. In your worship, heaven sing. And in your faith, the heavens rejoice. Amen. Today, rise up you. You are the future. We'll look at the book of Galatians chapter 1, verses 1. We'll jump to verses 6 to 12, and then verses 15 to 16. And it says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Verse 6 says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I not persuade men, O God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of God. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after men. For, it, for I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verses 15. 
But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Here we see that Apostle Paul was talking about how easily moved we have become to the gospel of God. And the only reason that could be is because we do not understand that we are standing on a firm foundation. The word of God is the same today. It was the same yesterday and it will be the same tomorrow. The word of God does not change, does not waver. So why is it that when we are going to, to carry out the great mandate that has been placed upon each and every one of us to preach the gospel, that we are shaking in it. We are shaking in the truth because we do not have that personal relationship with God himself. When Paul was writing this, he was very specific. He said, though we or an angel from heaven were to tell you something other than this which has been written, which means that he, he knew what he was writing was not from his heart, but it was from what God had revealed unto him directly. In order to understand that you have to have a distinctive, you have to know God's voice in a distinctive manner. Not the voice of apostle, not the voice of pastor, but God himself. In order for you to be able to come to church every Sunday and Friday and to hear the word of God and be imparted, you need to hear the voice in what the leaders are saying. You need to hear the voice of God behind the people that are standing on the pew. Because it is not them, but there is a spirit that carries them. The spirit that they preach by. And God also says that he has been called neither by men. And he has not been taught it by men. This means that the confidence he had is because he was not sent by us. He was sent by God himself to go out into the world and preach the gospel. We'll quickly look at the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. Okay, I'll just paraphrase a bit. It says we are created to be like God yeah. in true righteousness and holiness. Yeah. We are created to be like God. Our identity as Eagles on Heights, our identity as Powerhouse ministry is to be like God. But how are we going to be like someone we do not know? He, Jesus Christ came onto this earth to model for us what we should live, what we should continue to live, to be like God in righteousness and in holiness. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. It is not our place to be vengeance. It is not our place to be in judgment. But we are to be like God in holiness and righteousness. We will look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 3 to 5 says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and the power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Lord of my name. 
There's a relationship in order to experience the fullness of God completely. You need to have that relationship with God. Amen. That you move from just being a servant to being a child of God. Amen. That you move from just being a disciple of Jesus to being a friend of Jesus. Amen. It has to be that personal and intimate relationship with God himself. Yes. We oftentimes forget that the fullness of God is in our spiritual lives too. Amen. It is not only in, in the money we want yeah. to receive. Amen. It is not only in the jobs and in our academics. Amen. Some of us spend four hours a day studying. Four hours a week in prayer is not even up to it. It is not in that. It is in the prayer, in that intimate relationship we have with God. That intimate relationship where we can now boldly say like Paul. Boldly say that if I am telling you something that is other from the word of God, then know that something is wrong here. Paul said if we, not if them, which means even in his flesh, he understands that if he or any other were to preach a gospel that is contrary, let him be accursed. Mm. Do we know who we are, Eagles on High? Yes. Do we know who we are, yes. Brother yes. Yes. We understand that we have a mandate upon our yes. heads. We have all been called for the Great Commission. Mm. It is not for apostles and pastors and evangelists only. Mm. It is not for ordination at the church. Here he says he has, he has ordained you. Yeah. And at this time it is important to note that Jesus was talking to disciples at the time. They had not yet moved into the apostle rank. They were disciples at the time and he said go make disciples out of the nation. Yeah. Which means it is not for an apostle to make a disciple. Even as disciples ourselves we should understand that we should go out into the nation and make disciples disciples of other disciples. This is to tell us we are not just servants. We have that we have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the ability to move from the rank of being servants to being friends of Jesus. Prophets of old knew not just the, the acts of God but the ways as well. They knew how he operates and that's why they could tap into they understood his mind and it said in the word that the mind of God is the word Amen. they understood that and that's why they could operate in his fullness completely Amen. brethren let us wake up Amen. our 200k testimonies do not matter in heaven yes. the bible doesn't say that the cars we bought is what heaven's over and it's not to encourage poverty but it is to say that the bible says that the, the heaven rejoices over a soul Amen. that is born. Amen. Not over tens and millions of souls. A soul that is born. The same Bible says that anyone who causes a brethren to leave, to leave the kingdom of God, will have to answer for it. Anyone who doesn't follow up with their friends, when they see their friends are wavering in faith, will have to answer for it. Anyone who decides not to preach the gospel because they are waiting for a white collar will have to answer for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In conclusion, we are not just servants, but what makes us a holy nation and a peculiar people is that we have ever elevated into friendship with Jesus and we have become children of God. Amen. And the model that Jesus has given us, we should adapt fully. The miracles that he has done, he said, you shall do greater works than this. Hallelujah. Amen. From the church, grace descends like dew. Sacred cloth, both old and new. Bound together in one body, one soul. Grace unites us all, making us whole. In fellowship, grace is shared and known. A seed of kindness, tenderly sown. Within this walls, a sanctuary is found. Grace surrounds us, love's sweet sound. Amen. For in the church, a beacon bright. Grace shines forth, a guiding light. Empowered by this gift divine, we reflect God's love in every sign. Let us be vessels of grace's flow in the church and wherever we go. And both far and near, a testament of who we are.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In Jesus' name we have worship. Amen. I'd like us all to first raise our hands in prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask as your people have gathered here today that you fill this place, Father. That as I speak your word, Father, you fill the heart of your people. You guide them, you bring them to succession. Holy Spirit, let no soul that has walked in here walk out the same way. Father, we adore you. We magnify your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Eagles on heights. We fly in the glory. Eagles on heights. We fly in the glory. Amen, amen, amen. Firstly, I'd like to thank God because if not for God, I wouldn't be here. I'll thank my spiritual parents because they've been there for me. They've guided me. They've been that sole support. I thank my wonderful pastor, my strength, my leader, my big sister, my everything. I thank them. I also want to thank God for the life of my wonderful mom who has been there with me since day one and she will continue to stand for me. I want to thank God for her. So, brethren, I have a question for us all today. Whose child are you? Do you know your real identity? Yes. You don't sound sure at all. Yes. Do you know your real identity? Yes. It's, it's not balancing. But do you know your real identity? Yes. Well, I know mine. I'm Emmanuel Isesa of Christ. Yes. I'm born again and I'm in the lineage of Christ Jesus. You are complete in Christ. We all are complete in Christ, brethren. Amen. We are a new creation. We are the chosen generation. You may all be seated. Hallelujah. Brethren, demons are scared of us. Wizards have no hold over us. In Christ, we are complete. As I am, normally, Christ alone should have been my surname. But God has given me to my lovely mom, so I had to adopt a son. <laughs> this is something that's very personal. Do you know who you are? No, it's not who we are. Who you are. I'm talking to you. This is a personal matter. It doesn't involve anybody else except you and God. So I'd like to title this topic. Know your identity in Christ. Ask the person closest to you. Do you know your real identity? No. Neighbor, do you know your real identity? No. We don't sound so. Neighbor, I'm asking you, do you know your real identity? No. Of course you do know your real identity. Now let us read in the book of John 1 verse 12. I read in Jesus' name. But as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. You see, that it has been given to us. The children of that right to become the children of God. That speaks multitudes in us. I don't think some of us are getting it. When you become a children of God, nothing can hold you back. No one can shake you. Brethren, your identity, the main basis, involves being a children of God. This is, this is very amazing because we believed and we became. Ephesians 2 verse 19 says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and members of his household. I know myself. I'm a member of God's household. It may not be in that position I want it to be, but God has that specific purpose for me. In Colossians 2 verse 9 to 10, New Living Translation says, For in Christ lives the fullness of God in the human body. So we also are complete in our union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and every authority. That says a lot, doesn't it? Thank you. If you're very sure in your identity in Christ, please give me a loud Amen! Brethren, let us rejoice in our identity in 
Christ. Because we are no longer defined by the brokenness of our past. We are not defined by our struggles today. Rather, we are made new. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, The old is gone and the new is here. Indeed, the new is here. In reality, brethren, our identity in Christ is based on the things he has done for us. Do you believe so? Do you believe so, people of God? If you believe so, shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. For instance, in John 3 verse 16, God gave his only begotten son for you and I. That's very important. Imagine giving your only one to save. That's very, it shows how his love is so, I can't even put it in words. That's how great it is. An identity based on God's truth will never falter. An identity that is based in God's love will never fail. Brother, know this because his word is flawless and it's truthful. It is always within us and it stands by us. Proverbs 30 verse 5. So people of God, understanding your identity in Christ is very fundamental for every believer. Imagine trying to build up a structure with no base. What would happen? It would collapse. Ultimately, it, had, it served no purpose. Rather, when you start with a base, you start from the bottom, you go to the top. That's when you see the glory of the structure. It needs full light. Amen. Amen. Psalm 139, verse 13 to 16 reminds us that we are God's special creation. The word special on its own describes us. Special means something that holds great value. Special, something that is set aside from the dangers of the world. Special meaning we are intangible by the wickedness of anything around us. And in Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 27, we are told that we were made in God's image. God's image. We are perfect in God's image. This means we are not chosen by the standards of this world. We are chosen by our creator, the sovereign will of our creator. He has called each and every one of us by name, setting us apart as his own. We are a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. We are set aside. We are God's special possession. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise Master Jesus. This foundation, this truthful foundation is a stage set for our identity. Our identity which is rooted in Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. Note, our identity in Christ is not defined by our past. You may have done this or done that. You may have hurt somebody. But your identity is not defined by that. Your identity is defined by what God wants you to be. Know that instead, it's the transformative power of Christ in our lives. We are no longer enslaved by sin. Rather, we are children of God. We live according to his will. Indeed, in Christ, we are set free from the chains of sin and death. Brethren, we received the spirit of adoption so that we may be able to cry, Our Father, and our Father listens. He's always listening. He's always there beside us. Maybe we are very, very insolent to not listen to him. When we set aside that time, we take to speak to our Father. He's there. He's always waiting. He's waiting for his children to call upon him. Just like a child who trips and falls, they go to their parents for help. Our Father is always there for us. So, if the Son sets you free, indeed you will be free. You can find that in the book of John 8, verse 36. So, I need us to shout, He is my Lord. He is my, he is my Father. He, is my he has Lord. set me aside from the dangers of this world. He has set me aside. I have been removed from the sight of my enemies. Praise the Lord! Praise Master Jesus! Hallelujah! Notice, beloved, God loves us with an everlasting love. A love that cannot be matched by our parents or by the people we claim as our spouses. A love that is incomprehensible, that is insurmountable. That love is the love of Christ. 
He has loved us with an everlasting love which has continued for generations and generations until this point. We see as we're standing, this is love. We're able to move, this is love. Some people in hospitals are not able to speak without being assisted. That is love. My brother is able to play the keyboard, that is love. God has gifted him. We are able to sing, shout, glorify his name because of his love. With everlasting love, he has drawn us with his unfaithful kindness. The book of Jeremiah 31, verse 3. So, brethren, I'd like us to all stand as we read the word of God. And we open to the book of Romans 8, verse 1 to 2, and verse 16 to 17. I read in Jesus' name. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That speaks volumes. There is no condemnation for us, for we who are in Christ Jesus. And verse 2 tells us, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set us from the law of sin and death. Which means unprecedented death is not for us. Which means anything that has been planned against us is not for us. Verse 16, it tells us the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is amazing, isn't it? This is the guarantee of our salvation. We are saved. And verse 17 tells us, if now we are children, we are the heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs. So we carry power as well. And if we indeed share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. Yeah. It's so marvelous, honestly. Brethren, in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We stand victoriously over every child, over every con obstacle nothing can shake us nothing can hold me down i'm walking is there anything stopping me god's glory am i in a wheelchair no god's glory so what is stopping us from reaching out to our father when things go wrong not every wrong situation will stay like that forever that's one thing we need to understand we humans have this mindset of thinking once i'm done i am Rather, we should have the mindset of, if I fail, I can get up again. If I trip, I stand up and continue. In the race which I run, I fall, I stand up, and I win. That's the mindset we should have, brethren. Let us remember, dear church, that we are God's masterpieces. We have been molded into his perfect image. We have been created and crafted to fulfill the good works which he has placed and prepared for us. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We stand firm in his truth empowered by his love but in christ for what christ has done for us we can continue to do works in galatians 2 verse 20 it says i have been crucified as in i we have been crucified with christ i no longer live the flesh no longer lives but in christ lives in me christ in us our temple is the body of the holy ghost then now the life i live i live by faith in the son of god who has loved me for himself it's so it's it's so i i can't even explain but you know when your child tries to do something you tell them not to and they follow through they they go through that pain you feel the pain as well that's the pain god feels when we don't listen when we disobey his orders but when we obey his orders it brings joy to the heart. It brings great joy to his kingdom. When we save at least one soul, you know the kingdom of God is always rejoicing. We should be able to shine with his light in this world. We are the salt of the world. We should not adhere to what the world has for us. No, brethren. In this day and age, youthful people are struggling with their identities. People do not know what they are, but we as children of God know what we are. And we should be able to stand and say, no, we are supposed to help them to understand who they are. Bring them so that they may also partake in what God has in store for us. Yeah. This word has not been given to us for us to keep it. No, this word has been given to us so that we may spread it out to the world to preach out just the will of God. Because without us, the world has dead. The world is dead. Brethren, there's a time where it will come to the prince of the earth rising. But at that moment, we know we have saved every single soul. We should be able to go out. We should be able to speak about the word of God. Not holding back what Christ has done for us. 
Our testimonies can bring somebody to salvation. If you, it's just something that's very immaculate. Sorry for using your name, my brother. But yes, we are the salt of the earth. We bring flavor to this world. Just like food needs a flavor, we, we, the world needs us to bring flavor to this world, to bring the word of Christ into this world. Being confident of this, he who began his good work in you will carry it on until completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1 verse 6. So, I ask you again, who are you? Who are you? Rather, ask yourself, who am I? This is a personal matter. We cannot take it for granted. Once we let go of something like this, it may be lost. And it may be difficult to bring it up once again. Brethren, we need to embrace the truth. We need to transform more mere into participants of life. We cannot just be strangers to this word. We need to conform into what God has for us. We need to partake in his will. Heavenly Father, we are grateful because you know your work for us. We remember by Christ we are not defined by who we think we are. Rather what he says we are. Know that not what the people say to us, but what God says to us. We are loved. We are redeemed. And we are invaluable in his eyes. Let this knowledge continue to inspire us and guide us daily. What is your identity? And how do you know your identity? Praise Master Jesus. Now I would like us all to appeal to our state of hearts. Check your own your identity. If you are not yet part of God's family, if you are not yet born again, please let us bow our head and let us raise your right hand. Don't hesitate. Today is your day. And I'd like to call upon our mother in the church to carry us in prayer as we pray for those who believe that they are not saved, but they are indeed saved. So, mommy, can you please... Help us within this now the word has come this morning so that you will find who you are in Christ by receiving him as your Lord and your Savior. You hear this morning, it's not something to be ashamed of, it's not something to be afraid of. You want to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. Today I want to receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I would like you to lift up your hand and we'll pray for you quickly. Lift up your hand. Thank you for those hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Say this after me. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I believe in my heart that Jesus died for me. He was buried and rose again from the dead for my justification. Therefore, Lord Jesus. I say, I say with my mouth that you are, that you are my, Lord my Lord and my Savior, and I receive you, and I receive you into my life today. And, today. and from today, I declare, I declare that I am your child. I, am your child. I thank you I thank for you gave me your power you me to become your child. And today, and today I thank you. I am your child. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 May the Lord bless this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Forgiveness flows like a gentle stream, washing away what had once been. Through grace, Redemption calls out, Amen. a chance to stand a tall standing. In moments of weakness, grace abounds, yes. lifting us up when we have been down. Amen. A guiding light in the darkest night, guiding us on the right path. Mm. No sin is too great, no soul is too lost. Yeah. But at a great cost, 
grace extends. Amen. Through Christ's sacrifice, our debts are paid. Yes. We find our way through grace. So let us give life, hearts aflame, reflecting grace in Jesus' name. Amen. In our journey, may we reflect the boundless depths of God's own grace. Amen. Amen.